This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast Show 686. I'm a competitor and I compete at basketball like a high level, but like, um, I'm good on a journey and minding my own business. You understand? Uh, I think one thing that occurs as you get older, even like doing contract negotiations, the humility in that is making sure you don't miss out on your money or your or the right deal or situation, worrying about what the person left the right has. You know what I mean? It's kind of like a marriage. It doesn't that that relationship has nothing to do with anybody besides those two people. What's up, everyone? This is David Green, your host of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast, the best, the biggest, the baddest real estate podcast in the world here today with an amazing episode for you. Today, my co-host Rob Abasolo and I are interviewing our friend Evan Turner. Evan had a very impressive NBA career, and while he was in the NBA doing his thing, he was also buying real estate. He's now a businessman, an entrepreneur, and a real estate investor, and has been making bigger and bigger moves since he first got started, and he comes on the show to share with us his process, his journey, what he's buying, how he's buying it, and how he looks at the world, and you're going to love what you hear. Rob, what were some of your favorite parts of today's show? Oh, man, this is a, a favy fave, as I call it. It's one of my favorite episodes, man. We were just really having a lot of fun, and uh, for those of you, if you stick around to the very end, you're going to see me drop some pretty, I, I don't mean to be so intense about it, but some pretty intense basketball analogies there at the end. So I, I would definitely stick around to the end. You cannot miss this. Everybody, you have to listen <laughs> to this show. Rob <laughs> and his basketball, uh, I don't know if analogies is the best word, references are worthy of being made into a t-shirt. You definitely need to say these words to Rob when you see him <laughs> in real life. It was so bad, it was good in a way that only Rob Abasolo can do. Before we bring in Evan, by the way, guys, this episode is a little bit longer, so we're going to make a shorter intro for you because we took advantage of as much as we could to get as much out of Evan's brain as possible, which is why it's such a good show. Before we bring in Evan, today's quick tip is consider looking into opportunity zones as a way to save in taxes and still help the community. This is a wonderful marriage of uh, social improvements along with smart business moves. And it's one of the best moves that I think the government has made in a sense where you can get massive tax savings by investing in opportunity zones that also help the community where those properties are. And another part of Evan's success was his understanding that you win better as a team. So look for ways to surround yourself with like-minded people on the same journey as you, with the same goals as you that are highly skilled in what they do and find a way for you to contribute as well. All right, enough of that. Let's bring in Evan. Evan Turner, welcome to the Bigger Pockets podcast. Great to have you here, my friend. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you guys. Yeah. Now, if anyone hasn't heard of Evan Turner, I've never actually said this, so this will be the first time Evan's here, and he was one of the people that I actually followed your NBA career. Evan, when you first came out of college, I loved the way you played. A lot of people, they hear me talk about jujitsu, but basketball was my first love. And uh, like, I don't know, you were just the person who got it. You understood the game at a pretty high level. I really liked watching you play. We've talked about the stuff that we like and the things people don't like. I was a San Antonio Spurs fan. I hated when people were like, oh, they're boring. It's like, no, they they just play basketball the right way. They're good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they don't dunk all the time. They're boring. So uh, you were like that San Antonio Spurs style of like you understood the game as a whole. So I've been following you for a while. I had no idea that you were actually a real estate investor. It's very cool to get to know you here. And now you actually have your own podcast. So you can tell us a little bit about that and what the kind of stuff you guys talk about. Yes, yes. Thanks for having me. For one, I'm a big fan of, you know, your platform and everything you're doing is, is definitely dope. And um, this is cool. I've, I've been telling all my friends I was going to be on this podcast. So everybody's been like, for real? I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm really going to be on there. So <laughs> yeah, Rob dressed up just because he knew that you were really. Yeah, I heard he, he right, added he a pocket to his black T-shirt. He used to right. so I, I keep all my snacks in here. Hey, that's all that matters. You hear me crunching. Hey, don't worry. Just a few pretzels hanging out. <laughs> I appreciate that. But uh, like you were saying before, David, I was, uh, you know, I, I just re retired recently uh, in 2020 from a 10-year NBA career. And right now, myself and Andre Iguodala, we start a podcast. We just start our second season. It's called the Point For It Podcast. Much like David was saying, it's a play on words from a, a certain type of position in basketball, which myself and Iguodala were, were uh, point forwards. And um Obviously, we, we talk a little bit about basketball, but it's not fully a basketball podcast. We go over, you know, um, business elements of the podcast. We go over uh, current events and we like to have an overall good time just like this show. So podcast is, a, you know, the basketball part is the second element, but we're really trying to, you know, give free game and have, you know, the real conversations that most people won't have in their position. 
Yeah, man. So I'm curious. You obviously had you were in the NBA here for about uh, for about a good decade. So how did your day to day look? Did your entire career did it change, or was it always a pretty regimented day to day for you? It's always a pretty regimented day to day. I think you guys know as well as anything when you're focused and locked in and you're passionate about something. I feel like I've been it had been basketball. 15, 16 hours a day since I was probably 12 years old. So entering the NBA, it was the first real time I had an opportunity to do it like as a career. So the first, you know, you have to really, you know, wake up and it's six days a week. You know, you usually get to a facility around 8 a.m. Practice usually starts at 11. In between there, you're getting your your preparation going. You're eating meals. You're getting stretching. You're probably doing body work. And you're also, you know, lifting weights. And then you're going through a two, two and a half hour crazy regimen practice. And, uh, you know, you probably leave the facility each day by 2.30 or 3 p.m. If you're lucky after, you know, healing and icing and taking care of your body and, you go back home and do it the next day. So it's usually off and on, you know, even if you're not including game days, a 10 hour thing sometimes. You know, with that downtime, I got to imagine a guy like you, who's a very cerebral player, <clears throat> you're actually a very cultured man as well. We talked for about 50 minutes before we started recording and man, you were all over the place. That was pretty cool to see. What was your thought process like? What emotions were you going through when you were in the middle of the career and you realized that real estate was a, a road that you wanted to explore? I think it was just a door I was, Thankful that, uh, you know, I can knock on because at the end of the day, when you, you know, you make it to the NBA and you're living such a fast life with, you know, the opportunities that you have, you have access to a lot of money, you have access to the best of best things. And, you know, like everything else, you have to govern yourself in order to explore it and also in order to learn. And I think that was one thing I was able to do where real estate somewhat gave me the flexibility you know, I knew um, if I bought a piece of property, it wasn't going to pick up and leave on me. And, uh, you know, when I first started out at, which was Columbus, Ohio, I was able to, you know, have a familiarity with the people and the environment in order for me to invest and be able to leave and have a time demanding job like the NBA. Was there a little bit of a, a real estate bug at any point during the your career or was it really something that at the very end you decided to go into it? Was it, it did you see other friends investing in real estate? What what was really that catalyst for you? To be honest with you, like I don't know what you all's background, but when, where I came from, like the typical stuff, I was an inner city kid, single parent, you know, home and everything. So to comprehend money, I wasn't too familiar with that. And to go into the NBA and, you know, have a large lump sum of money and, you know, you hear all these crazy stories around that time. We we're just coming out of one of the biggest financial crisis and everything. So when my finance company is trying to suggest, in, you know, um, investing in stocks, I never, you know, really believe in that. You know, I was more so humbly speaking, just being like, no, show me what I own more so than tell me about what's going to happen. And, you know, hit me with the OD WAP do. And I think to say that story was just an understatement because uh, I wanted to make sure my money worked for me. And like David, like what you said, money's energy. So I wanted to make sure I had money going somewhere in an asset with the you know finances that I had much more than just sitting on it and, and not making it work for me. And I was always fortunate enough to have family and mentors like my mom to tell me that, you know, basketball isn't always going to be there. And I got to make sure that, uh, you know, my plan B is, you know, being worked on as, you know, before I need it. Totally. So going from you know, not having a lot of money to getting that large lump yeah. sum payment. Yeah. <laughs> I got to imagine it's pretty weird. Um, I, I've kind of gone through this in my real estate entrepreneurial career a couple of times, and it's really hard to comprehend. I mean, yeah, it's did, were there mo yeah, did you ever like look, look at your accounts and everything and just not really believe it? Like, what was that whole thought process? Now, to be honest, which I don't know how you feel when you look at some of your stuff, but, you know, I'm so grateful that sometimes when I look at my accounts and stuff, like, you know, it's not like it brings a tear to, like, to my eyes or anything, but I'm just like, I'm just grateful. Like, this is really mine. You know what I mean? Like, this is what, you know, hard work really brings. And um, I guess, you know, as you guys comprehend, it takes years and years and years to see the fruits of your labor. So, you know, I'm just appreciative to really to have stuck in with a dream, a passion, and all the sacrifices I made to see it come back in that type of form is is a blessing. And uh, it's something I never take for granted because, you know, in, in this situation, it's a reason why they call it the 1%. Not many people are able to experience that. So it almost feels uh, you have survivor's remorse. But at the same time, you know, when you're back, when you're, when you're on your hustle, you know, you, you, you're appreciative towards it and you deserve it.
hundred percent. Yeah. I, I, I still, I really do struggle with this a lot because I just, it, it, it's not, I'm not going to say I came from nothing. That's definitely not true. My parents were immigrants from Mexico and they did have a, a tough, uh, it was, you know, it was money was tight growing up. Right. Yeah. And so it, it's been very hard to break out of this because I, I have this big fear of, of losing it all because I'm just like, Oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to go back, but, um, I don't know. What was your first big mindset shift going in, in, into kind of this new phase of life where, you know, money was plentiful. Were you using that as an opportunity to kind of uh, learn? Were you going back to your family with that? Like, what were some of those big changes for you? I think the biggest changes for me, um, obviously, the first thing you do is go take care of your mom. You know what I mean? And I wanted to, you know, take care of my mom, get her house and everything. But I think the biggest change for me was trying to fully comprehend what money was, that's an understatement. Like, it was, it was a huge, a huge, huge lump sum of money. I wanted to make sure uh, I came in with the right opportunity and plan to, you know, have it work the right way for me. I was more so scared of losing it more than anything. And that was a big fear to me, almost so much to the first point. Like, my first three or four years, I barely spent money on anything. You know, like, I, like I, I think I had, you know, I was fortunate enough to have reached a certain financial mark by the age of 24 that would have took care of me for, you know, the rest of my life in that certain realm. So I was kind of like still, you know, touching the water, seeing how hot it was. But, you know, during that time, I wasn't hesitant in, uh, you know, to dive into real estate and to invest in that because I, I knew for sure I want an asset along with, you know, keeping the money with me. Okay. That is very insightful because yeah, it's odd that you hear a person who I mean, you hear about lottery winners, the majority of them don't keep their wealth. Hardly any of them do. In fact, their life tends to go to crap when they get that money. It isn't, it's like the analogy that I use is it's like you, you never worked out and you held this barbell above your chest for bench press and someone throws four plates on each side when you get that. It's like <laughs> you had no foundation to handle that and the money crushes you. So I'm sure a lot of the people that were making money through being a professional athlete that you're around, it was a scenario for them. They never had it. They got a bunch of it all at once. They weren't trained for how to handle the weight of that. They lose it. You were in almost the opposite scenario. You're saying, I was afraid of losing that money, and I had to overcome the fear of losing what I had gained as opposed to uh, the discipline of saving it. What do you think led up to the moment when you received the money and you wanted to keep it that was different in you than in some of the people that were around you? I just think the upbringing, I'm not trying to make my situation seem like, oh, I came from this or try to write like a documentary on myself. But I think, you know, a lot of times it's simple as fact as this, if, if money doesn't mean something to you, you weren't broke enough. You know what I mean? And, and that's just true. And it, it's a God honest truth. So like when you break it down, I'm a, I believe in Darwinism, survival of the fittest. You understand? And there's a game we play of life, and there's certain things that you really have to, you know, take in, into consideration in order to win. And, um, you know, it's all the stuff they taught you as a kid. Make your next move your best move. And I think the environment I hung around as well, I, you know, I've been fortunate enough to have the right type of people around me. I came into a locker room as a rookie where I had Elton Brand, who was huge in, you know, investing in real estate, investing in movies. I had Andre Iguodala, who's, you know, speaks for himself. He's a tech entrepreneur, and he was very, you know, business savvy. I was fortunate enough to be around the right people, and with my notoriety, the right type of people came into my uh, circle that can give me, even if it was bad finance advice, it was more than I ever heard growing up. You know what I mean? And I think that type of environment really was able to mold me, right, because I was able to stay in the right rooms and somewhat hear some of the, you know, get the leftovers of, 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 of game. It's really cool, man. So would you say uh, was one of your first pieces of real estate that you bought the, the house for your mom? First uh, real piece of real estate I bought, honestly. So the first one I bought, we had rented a spot for her and I bought a five unit in Columbus, Ohio, while her spot was being built. So we could say 50-50, whatever got closer. But yeah, I was I was able to buy a uh, you know, a 5,000 square foot crib in a up and coming uh, community outside of Columbus um, that was able to make a pretty penny when we sold it. You know, we bought it in, in I think the land in like 2010 and uh, the house was done at 344. We were able to sell it for like 655 as of like a year ago. So that I think is one of the huge, huge, huge foundational pieces for someone that becomes a real estate investor. It's so important that you have a good experience on your first deal. 
like we all have this amazing amount of fear and people don't realize that I'm sure the three or the two of you would agree. The three of us, even today, when I buy a house, I still have fear. There's always that what if that hangs over your head and it's amplified in the beginning when you get that first one. And if you have a bad experience, you're like, I'm never doing it again. You have a good experience. It really helps to overcome that fear. So what I love that you're describing is it was a primary residence. That's what you're saying. That was the first house you bought was a place for your mom, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that is why we talk about house hacking so often because it gives it gives you an experience to get your toe dipped in without getting your foot bit off yeah. by the shark or without yeah, drowning. Absolutely. Was that a, was that how your experience was? Yeah, basically we were able to you know buy into an area early, build a house up, and there was no real pressure. That was just an asset. You know what I mean? It was a, a very good asset in my opinion at that time. That, you know, when we sat on it, we were able to live and make memories and it's time to move on. I was grateful we bought it because, like I said, prior to, we were able to double our investment on it. And we, you know, it taught me a lot as an investor and in buying into something and seeing how it builds. And like you said, prior to, money's energy. I put however much money into that house and without looking and just living and enjoying myself in it, we were able to make double off it what we, what we put in, so... That was that was a blessing. So that that was that's one thing I always take with me when it comes to uh, continue to try to build and keep my patience. Sure, sure. So you 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 build a, a five unit, or you buy a five unit, you sell it, you make a really good profit, right? And then what happens after that? So after that, um, I went right into uh, I went on a campus and I bought two two six bedrooms on campus uh, where students could uh, rent rent properties from, and I own that. Obviously. Um, with real estate, I was able to get that on campus. I put it in an LLC. And, uh, you know, one good thing about that is, you know, we're able to do from August to August type situation. Um, you, can, you can guarantee that most of the students, especially back then, student loans, all that money, all that rent is going to be guaranteed each month. So I was able to, you know, take advantage of an open real estate market in Columbus and uh, finesse from there. And um, with that, which I was fortunate enough to occur is uh with those same builders, I took that money and uh, the profits from that money and I invested into a new apartment condominium that was built in 2014. It was called 600 Goodell. Um, I think uh, when I, I invested a couple hundred thousand with a 8% rate of return. And um, within the first two years, I was able to get all my money back, which, which was big time. And then from there, once they sold it, um, you know, fortunately enough, it's been an annual return of 36% since then, you know? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so so that was, good, shout out to the- good the, experience there too. Yeah, man, it's good experience mixed with a lot of good luck. Like I said, coming to Columbus, Ohio, you guys are all familiar. I live a couple blocks away from campus, but, you know, being out here, um, you have a lot of uh, real estate developers such as the Kaufmans, the Shadenstein families, the Schiff families, the the dashes, the diamonds, where I was fortunate enough with basketball to do well here, that it opened doors and open opportunities to invest in some really good prop, uh, really good opportunities where Columbus is being built, was being built up as I was, you know, making my wealth, you know? Sure. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's really all that much luck. You're obviously, you made it into the NBA and had a successful career because <laughs> yeah. you had hard work. Yeah. You know, luck is, is a component that comes into play when you're really good at something. So you're obviously crushing it in the, in the real estate game at this point. You get, you get the house, you make a sale, you get a couple of six bedrooms, and then you invest in this apartment condominium. At what point do you feel like you told yourself, like, I'm pretty good at this? I, I, I kind of keep it humble in that sense because one thing I thought, you know, respectfully, if you ask me what I'm an expert at, I'm a, I was an expert is proven at basketball. You understand what I'm saying? So, like, I thought, like, at one point, I think after the first couple, you know, talking with, you know, some of my mentors, some of my advisors, I was like, man, this is turning out pretty good enough to the point where I'm, ta I'm passing up on trying to buy certain cars and being like, yo, I'm going to get this car after – I flipped this to take that, you know, you know, almost to the point where I would leave in the fall, leave my, leave my city in the fall, go work where I had to work at and come back in the spring and feel as though I was going to come back and reap the rewards of a pretty good investment. So I don't know if that was a sure thing much, you, you know, but it, I, I thought like it was going to work for me and uh, luckily it has. Well, something that I learned in basketball, I think a lot of people who play that sport or other team sports learn is that your individual uh, skills of whatever type you have 
manifest very differently within a different group. So you could take a certain player and put them on a team and they are lackluster and then they get on another team and like, boom, absolutely amazing, right? Absolutely. And, and I think we that doesn't get talked about very often because you can typically, <clears throat> most of the conversation, let's use the basketball example here, would be about how you improve your own skills, ball handling, defense, shooting the ball, uh, strength, speed, jumping. But the really smart players are the ones who say, now I know I would be good in this environment. And they actually make that a part of their career is they're, they're willing to take a little bit less money to extend to play longer on the right team, right? That works in business too. You can have an incredibly skilled person who can analyze properties great, network really good. They have you know some version of skill within real estate investing, but they never get around the right team. They don't have the right advisors. They don't have the right environment. There's no deals where they're looking. They don't have a bookkeeper, an accountant, a construction. Con- I mean, sometimes just having a contractor that solid can make a deal work for you. That would not have worked if you didn't have that one piece. You mentioned you were blessed enough to be surrounded by some mentors and some guidance and the right piece. What role did that team that you found yourself around play in helping you be successful in this endeavor? I think everything. I think they helped a lot due to the simple fact of uh, their willingness. You understand what I'm saying? It's one thing for people to work with you. It's another thing for people to help you. And I think along those lines, uh, you know, in regards to, you know, us doing good business together, each time we were able to make a flip or do something or, you know, when I would come up to somebody and be like, hey, I'm looking, you know, for some deals. I'm looking to invest. I was always fortunate enough to be turned in the right direction. And also, I think in regards to like just the behind the scene things in regards to funding and, you know, you might get into a deal with a guy where, the developers are are guaranteeing all the risk. You know what I'm saying? And 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 we're able to, you know, just invest freely. I, I thought like the support and the timing of the people in uh, you know, the city of Columbus helped the most with me. My I think my finance advisors finding the right type of loans, making sure, you know, from day one my business and my finances were in order to make sure I had ways to free up lines of credit, making me comprehend how important the lines of credit are is in order to get things done because you know right now I'm playing in a situation where my interest rate is still at four when everybody's still at ten. You understand what I'm saying? So like those type of moments where I'm able to foresee, be able to have a team that can foresee a forecast and you know have me steer towards less turbulent air is is everything because uh, I haven't really felt the bump in the road yet. I've been able to you know keep uh, you know adding more and more points to, uh, you know, to, to my portfolio. Yeah. That, and that makes sense to, to have those mentors and the people that you're working with and the people that are helping you. I got to imagine too, that you, you probably had some buds in the same, you know, also coming out of the league and everything like that, that were also doing real estate. Were you sort of surrounding yourself with more people that, that were like-minded at that point, or were you keeping your network the same, you know, for the first couple of years? I've always been told, like, even uh, my mentor, uh, you know, my OAU coach, you know, Coach Mullins, he used to always just tell me, like, even when I was in college and stuff, just like, what book are you reading? Like, make sure you read something. Or like, if you heard I went to a rap concert or whatever, say, like, all right, bro, stop going to rap concerts, go up the street, go see Hamilton, or go... You know what I mean? Like, I always choice, good choice. Yeah, but I've always been encouraged to go outside of my element and go learn more. And um, I, I, I'm a stubborn individual, and some people say I might not listen a lot, but in certain areas, I make sure, for whatever reason, I I listen at the right time. And that was one thing I always knew that was important to my development because, uh, you know, crossing into an unreal world in the NBA, I was more so wary of uh, making sure I didn't lose myself or my footing. And, uh, you know, to really keep in touch with the people and the elements around me, whether it became real estate or it became, you know, some other hobby was part of my everyday regimen. And I think that's where it, it helped benefit me in the right rooms of meeting people who, you know, wanted to buy real estate. I think it's very easy for anyone in any capacity to just zoom in on their own thing and not take that perspective, like you said, getting exposed to more stuff. So I see this with investors where they're very comfortable analyzing a property. They're the people that like to use a spreadsheet. They like to run numbers and they just do that over and over and over. And they never zoom out and take a look at, am I, is the market I'm analyzing a good market to be in at all? Or 
what does the appraiser do? How do they come up with the numbers that they're looking at? Like the more you learn about the different people's jobs that are in whatever you're doing, the better your chance of being successful in that. And I think you sort of stumbled into that without realizing that was necessarily happening by just exposing yourself to more than the little stuff that was around you, right? Absolutely. And I, I think one thing that occurs as well is, you know, with anything is humility. You know, sometimes when I get too cocky on a basketball court, the basketball guys are going to teach me my lesson. You know what I mean? So like even coming around into this business world, I think I was able to, you know, keep my ears open because I was humble because I comprehended who the experts were. The same way I got off my butt, rearranged everything when I found out about the Bigger Pockets conference. Because at the end of the day, it's like I need to go around and be around like-minded people and go talk to the people that have been doing this at a high, high level and they can show me, you know, different ways of thinking and, and maneuvering. It, it, it's never changed. It's just me want to learn. And, and, you know, when my direction is going that way, I'm going to, you know, knock on those doors and try to, you know, walk through them. Have you seen a pattern of others around you that want to get a piece of what you're doing, whether it's business, entrepreneurship, tech, real estate, and you've noticed like the the thing that stops them from fitting through the doorway of where you're at is a lack of humility. I think it's a mix of lack of humility, which kind of turns into a uh, you know a lack of humility always turns into a uh, 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 ignorance because uh, you know you mix humility in with learning, and when you learn, that's where innovation comes from. And I think a lot of guys they'll stop at the at the door when they see how hard it takes or how many loops they have to jump or sometimes the number one thing is you guys may know everything ruins when the percentages come in mm -hmm. and we're fighting over money that doesn't even exist yet like you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. i think a lot of times those dudes are so wary of, of 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 coming into those problems mixed in with if you don't surround yourself with the right people there's a lot of crooks in this day and age as well so i think guys stay on the stoop more so than than going to a uh, adventure off yeah, so you're referring to the people that are arguing over the split of an endeavor before they even understand how the money flows or yes. what they're going to be doing, right? Yeah, yeah, just that right. type Which of Which is really ego. That's what you're getting at, right? <laughs> yeah, like absolutely. I need to have the bigger share because of my ego, even though they don't really understand. You know, I'll give you an example that makes me think about in sports. Sometimes you see a player negotiate a ridiculously large contract for them on a team, and then the team has no money left in the salary cap to bring anybody else in, and then they lose. Yeah, and, and, and then they're talking about, I'm trying to win. I'm trying to yes. win. It's like, bro, with all due respect, all the greats <laughs> gave up money. If you want that 20-point score, 55, you know what I mean? Like 35 million and 40 million, it's a difference, but it ain't much of a difference. You're going to get it in, you know what I mean? You're going to get it back some way. In other ways, that's exactly right. One of the things we've been talking about within the, the businesses I run is stop talking with words telling me what you want. So you'd hear these people say, I'm doing everything I can to bring a championship to the city. That's what your words say, but your actions say, I'm getting every dollar I can for myself. And now they got to go bring in a you know 38-year-old veteran or draft a rookie who can't play yet to fit within the salary cap. Your actions are telling me, no, you're actually just trying to get paid and the championship would come second. Now, we're not trying to win championships in real estate, right? But there is something to be said about what your actions are saying to the world and to other people versus your words. No, you're absolutely right. That's the understanding. You hit the nail on the head because when you break it down and you're working with certain teams, it's like, yo, this is about the development. This is about the bigger picture. And um, sometimes you look at guys, you would think uh, they got like a reality TV show following around. You know what I mean? And it's like, uh, I think one thing that humility is I, I'm willing to work as a team with this real estate group. I'm, I'm willing to, you know, make sure I want to make sure I'm investing the best things and whatever can happen best for the group. It's great for us. because, like Warren Buffett said, you don't want to lose a dime, you know. So, you know, if it comes down to like the Fishers, like the urgent care um, campus I own, I just sold recently in 2021, I partnered 50 50 with someone out there. You know what I mean? We took uh, responsibility, took the accountability, but I partnered 50 50 with someone out there. And what was it 2019, 2020 hits, pandemic occurs and we're booming and, you know, all that type of stuff. And, um, you know, just recently I was able to sell that at a 50 50 split and got, you know, uh, uh, a sizable profit from there just off being able to partner up and not trying to control the situation and, you know, financing what is a right and good idea and good play, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. So obviously you were sort of crushing it there at the very beginning and uh, you, you kind of were diversifying there with all the different types of units. Now that you've spent some time in real estate, 
Can you help us understand what your goals are and how you set those goals for yourself? Being honest with you, the next thing I invested in uh, is uh, block housing. So um, it's basically in Columbus, we got funding from the city or whatever, but um, it's just more housing. You know, everybody's screaming out that we don't have enough rental housing and re rental property, but I want to make sure we're able to uh, develop something where it's providing, providing more homes for uh, people that kind of grew up in my situation. You know what I mean? Um, I definitely have uh, opportunities of, uh, I definitely have ambitions of making sure I do like the luxury real estate and, uh, you know, the vacation real estate. But I definitely want to go back to my old, you know, old neighborhoods and stopping grounds of that, that matter. And, you know, building, you know, buying portfolios and foreclosed homes and, you know, kind of rebuilding a block. You know what I mean? Yeah. Is that, is that something that's important to you just because of the your upbringing and everything like that yeah i think it's very important because at the end of the day it's like how hard is it to put something decent for the youth to grow up in like you understand what i'm saying like i used to hoop like hoop in the alley it takes nothing to pave a spot go put a basketball court over there or go put you know what i mean go put something that is really going to help the families but then also help the future whether it be an area with you know, a decent swimming pool area with a decent computer lab or, you know what I mean? I want to make sure in those city areas, much like, I don't know where you all are from, but in the city areas, in those isolated dead areas, sometimes we, our resources is like we get cut off from the rest of the world. So we don't get like the Whole Foods, we get the Dollar Generals or Save-A-Lots. We don't get the, high, you know what I mean? We don't get like the the orange, like the Sun Kiss. We get like the orange pop like you know what i mean like the knockoff dr stuff. s yeah yeah and i kind of want to make sure we, we you know we make the you know, the neighborhood you know a positive the hood you know bring back positivity towards the hood because you know it starts with yourself once you start appreciating your environment and what you have you know that's going to you know breed confidence and everything else so that's one thing i really want to do that's a big picture and then other than that i would love to uh own you know vacation real estate all over I would love to do that, uh, like in Lake Como, own in Bali. Um, you know, I, I want to own in Barcelona. Like, it's tons of places I've visited. I, I definitely want to tap into those markets. I haven't really uh, dived into the international vacation rental market yet, but hey, Barcelona sounds nice. Yeah, but you're diving into something that's pretty cool, though. It's uh, was it the hotels? Yeah, yeah, we bought a, a yeah. unit motel in New York. Yeah, yeah, months ago. Yeah, I love that idea. That's going to be unbelievable because that way you can theme everything, right? You guys are going to kind of have theme type vibes. I think, I think obviously I want to steal your idea, but in the grand scheme of things, curating those type of environments and everything is something I would really be interested in for sure. I, I think those type of getaways, I've always, even if you see my my condo, is filled with art and just a type of vibe and theme that really you know curates your energy and mood. One of the things I really liked about what the government did with the tax code in the last couple of years was the creation of opportunity zones where they rewarded investors with tax benefits if they invested into areas that they deemed as an opportunity zone, which were typically lower income, struggling. They're not getting the same influx of uh, resources that the nicer areas are going to be, right? What are your thoughts on that principle uh, as a way of building wealth that as the inv as the investor improves the area, they also make themselves money and you kind of have a win-win scenario. Yeah, I think it's necessary because you have to entice people. You know what I mean? I don't think anybody's going over there, you know, or any smart investor is going to try to go over there and start with rebuild where there's no guarantee of anything coming to support you, you know? So I think, uh, I think that's a perk you get for, you know, taking that type of chance and trying to, you know, rebuild certain parts that have literally been systemically forgotten. You know what I'm saying? Uh, when we talk about those opportunity zones, we're going back to the 1940s. We're talking about the buy, you know, the racial wealth gap in America and, and you know, everything that's happened systemically, you know, uh, the, you know, you know, the housing loans only granting, you know, 98% of the best real estate to whites. You know what I'm saying? Like that type of situation. So I think when it comes down to it, there's, we hate talking about reparations, but in certain areas you have to uh, have that to support because especially when it comes to black athletes or black entertainers that made out that area, odds are a lot of times unless it's super beneficial or developers haven't talked about building that area up prior to or trying to gentrify it. 
nothing's ever coming and the only people helping are the people that climbed out of that barrel from the other crabs you know what i mean yeah so yeah, it's it's, sure. it's, de it's deeper than rap i hope i hope the city and everybody and a, and a government keeps trying to do more to help invest in those upbringings because at the end of the day much more than real estate we we we're only as good as our worst guy you know that david we're only as good as our the last man on the bench i'm not saying anybody in those low income areas but at the same time it's like yeah it's just a tr it's just a truth like there's no such thing. I, I'm not okay if I'm making a bajillion dollars and the guy up the street is messed up. Like, that's just not ill. Yeah, yeah. I, I think opportunity zones do create that win-win for a lot of people. We actually did a, a whole episode with Malachi Sims, episode 599 it, it, for everyone at home yeah, listening. Yeah. I would really recommend <laughs> checking checking that one out. Yeah, uh, yeah I have all the, the episodes memorized. No, I'm just kidding. I, I looked it up. But have you done much investing in opportunity zones yet or is that a big goal for you kind of moving into 2023 so that's uh so recently we just um with the block housing i just invested I, actually from a shoe company that i signed with david coming out i i took a bunch of stock back in 2010 that stock was at a few pennies it grew to a bunch i was able to take money out of there and invested strictly into the opportunity zone. Mm. So, like did I said, did you avoid the, some of the capital gains from the the gain you had in the? Yes, 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 yes. So, uh, like I said, that's one of the circles from having a great team. That that don't let me take all. Shout out to Steve Vojovic, Advocates, uh, Advocates uh, Financial. That was the team doing that. Matt Anderson. That was the team doing that and making that play. So when we were able to do that. We're able to put it into uh, opportunity zones to block housing, and uh, with that, you know, the city was able to, you know, to work with us as well. So we're able to be able to build some stuff coming up. We're in production right now. That's what I loved about the opportunity zone approach: is it didn't try to guilt people into investing money into something that would lose them money, and it didn't say, "Well, forget it. They don't. They can't pull themselves out. So let's just ignore them." There was a a way of saying, listen, rather than us taking your money and the government trying to make this better, which is going to be 10 times more expensive than it should be and be a terrible job, let's take the people that are good at real estate investing, give them a tax break to get them to go in and do what they are good at, and then everyone wins. And like, I love, Evan, how you kind of tied it together where you, you added the team aspect we talked about earlier, right? You had people that understood the shoe business. I'm sure your contributions to that company, when you bought the stock for pennies, you realized like some of your direction, counsel, guidance, whatever resources you were bringing to that investment would make it more likely to be successful. Then it does well. You take the profit out, you reinvest it into the thing that you care about. It benefits you because you don't get hammered on taxes. So now you're not disincentivized to do another project just like it. And you get to invest in the area that matters to your heart, which gets you more motivated and amped up to do it again, as opposed to, like we said, you have that bad experience on your first deal. You don't want to do it anymore. If you have your bad experience with your first, like I'm trying to help somebody at my own expense. Now you don't want to help anymore. Yeah. Like, right. Everything right, right. worked well. Now you want to play the game harder. Yeah, no. And that's absolutely right. I think uh, one thing that's occurring now that I retired is being an adult. You know, I want to, you know, kind of take the gloves off and um, I obviously have my team with me, but you know, have my hand held a little less, you know what I mean? And um, in order to go from being an investor and, you know, developing smaller things to, like I said, getting getting groups and me being a forefront of the funding and, you know, developing big commercial buildings where there's a 7-Eleven at the bottom or whatever cool chain store there is and there's luxury buildings up top, you know what I'm saying? So I think that it's a next level of, you know, playing harder and kind of, you know, trying to make it to the Hall of Fame and say the least. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, so you, 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 we have an understanding of sort of where you were growing, but can you give us a snapshot now of, of the different types of bigger projects and developments that you're working on? Because I know, I know you're doing a lot of development now, right? Yeah. So I'm doing a lot of development now. So uh, even as recently, um, I invested it into a, a unit right off on uh it's called san marcos residence it's in uh, austin texas so i invested that with shift capital so it's about 95 percent occupied it was a it was an old like i believe like hotel or something we uh invested we refurbished it back in like 2018 it's about a it's a college apartment building probably like 150 doors 200 200 doors so i thought that was a pretty big one i invested in um right now um I have a vacation property that I bought during pandemic for two. 
I put a a little bit into it, probably three into. I have on the market right now for eleven. So it's a yeah. So it's a eight thousand square foot, three house, three houses, guest house, pool, seven acres inside uh, Briars Creek Golf Community, uh, right outside Charleston, South Carolina, like three miles from Kiowa. So you see that little area. We just um. That little area has been booming. You know, obviously everybody knows about Charleston. It's one of the most touristy, you know, tourist visited cities in America. And, um, you know, we, we got with a, a group down there, I think, when I first bought the spot during the pandemic in 2020. And um, obviously it's a fixer upper, but I was looking into, uh, you know, just using it as a vacation property, you know, for family and everything. But uh, halfway through the market just jumped crazy and um, we were able to, you know, it, it jumped crazy up and the house I was building was already pretty spectacular. And I was getting like a lot of uh, compliments on it to the point where I was like, if I can make this flip and, uh, you know, sell this, I would love to, you know, continue on, take that money, buy acreage and, uh, you know, start doing a little, you know, 12 unit, you know, um, development. Man. Okay. Let, I don't want to gloss over this. That's a, that's a crazy Crazy project, so yeah. I'm, try, okay. I'm trying to be humble about it because, like, I'm, yeah, I like, know. if you and I, I were off, of, if you and I were off the th- off this, I'd be hyped. Be like, bro, guess what I just did? <laughs> like, do you understand what I'm saying? But like, oh, I'm yeah, trying to definitely. be like, I'm trying to like, you know, be calm and not make eye contact and you know hold my smile. Oh no, no, we're I gonna know, change that right now. You're gonna tell us exactly how you did this. <laughs> yeah. Hey, look, yeah. I'm I'm t- I'm turning off the record button. Click. Okay. All right. Uh, now you can tell tell me and David. So, all right, you 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 stumble upon this property. I guess, uh, was your intention, you say it's a vacation property. Let me clarify. Do you mean like a vacation rental? Is that the idea? Like, oh, is just, it a no, no, just, a, just a vacation for like, for me and my family, like family home, like a getaway. Like cool. you, you take it from Columbus, it's an hour plane ride. You land three miles at the airport, three miles, you're right there into 85 degree weather nonstop. So I'll, I'll go back into how I started. So, uh. I was looking in, you know, vacation properties and rental properties, and I kept hearing about Charleston, Charleston, Charleston. And, you know, obviously, uh, I, I don't like being on planes like that. So I was I was checking, the, you know, the time limit and everything for flights, and I found I was only an hour away. Um, I had um, my mentor, once again, had people in the area that were very familiar with it. So um, I was able to go out there, start house hunting, and start searching, and uh we stumbled across Briars Creek, uh, Briars, Briars Creek uh, golf course, and um, the developer of the golf course was actually selling his own, you know, house. He built it and everything. He was selling it. He was trying to get out of there. I think he's trying to move somewhere to certain some part of South Carolina. And um, we showed up, and you know, prior to that, we went to Kiowa. And you know, if you don't, if, if you go to Kiowa with anything under ten million, you're not finding anything with space. And on top of it, if you're spending that much money, to me, I want land. So that's why I ended up in Briar's Creek. And uh, once I saw the seven acres and the three houses and and, uh, I knew it was a fixer-upper, I was like, okay, I'll be able to, you know, get this for a pretty good price. The price wasn't terrible. But, uh, you know, the number one thing I did was try to go out there, find a house, and find a contractor that I could trust. You understand what I'm saying? A contractor that knew the area. And... um, that was my guy from Red Woods uh, Landscaping, uh, you know, contracting, and that was Tom Grisanti. And from there, we were just able, we were trying to figure out the best way to build the best house and not lose money into it. You know, I like lavish things. I like nice things. So, you know, some of our tastes a little up to par, but, you know, when I bought it for two, I was able to put three into it. During that time, I don't know what happened to the housing market or anything, but my land, my space, everything just catapulted to the point where... By the time it was getting done, we were able to, you know, put it on a market for damn near double. You know what I'm saying? And uh, yeah, did it sell? Uh, so we just put it on a market two weeks ago, and um, oh, okay. So we we have somebody coming tomorrow to take a second look. So it's people all over. Uh, not to brag on it, if it doesn't sell by then, it'll be on selling Kiowa, being recorded on the 15. Um, I'll send you guys a link over after so you can see. But it's 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 a beautiful crib and um. You know, to go deep into it, it I think timing and luck and not just luck, but, you know, timing and kind of when you know it's right, it's right. I didn't hesitate on this feeling. So I went out there trying to, you know, probably spend like 
one something or something under. I wasn't nat- naturally going out there to go in and refurbish something. But once I realized the investment in a property and I saw the opportunity, I'm like, okay, I understand what my budget was. But if I'm up here and it's an opportunity to do it, I'm going to do it right. And I think that commitment was what really, you know, gave me, allowed me to re- reap the fruits of this labor because I wasn't hesitant. I was like, I believe in this area. I believe in what I bought. I'm not about to do, you know, what prior homeowners did and just buy a crib and just not invest what it should. You know what I'm saying? It's like, if this area is worth it, like they say, I'm going to set the tone or at least follow up with my next door neighbors and refurbish the house and, you know, you know, add value into the community. And I think that's one thing I committed to doing that really, you know, I guess made me look genius, which wasn't. Well, I don't know if I'd say it wasn't like part of the genius that expresses itself on a basketball court is when you see the right play to be made in that moment. It's very hard to translate that onto like X's and O's. Like you can't write it down on a piece of paper and say, this is how you know when you write the right. It's a feeling. You've played enough basketball. You see the opening. You know what you should do in that scenario. Investing works out the same way. Like a lot of times I think genius is expressed through feeling. It's very difficult to describe how Eminem can write a rap that is different than someone else or Beethoven can create a symphony that is different. When you're, when with this project, you recognize through a feeling, I need to, I need to rehab it. I need to remodel it the right way. Other people don't see the angle of how important this is, but you did. Now, on the flip side, you mentioned timing and luck. You actually probably had some bad luck and some bad timing. You had some good uh, timing buying the property and the vision, but then interest rates have been skyrocketing right after you bought this thing and you put on the market as rates are going up and more expensive properties are absolutely more susceptible to uh, like uh, uh, more, <clears throat> what's the word I'm trying to say here? The higher a price is, the more sensitive it is to the interest rate. So like an $11 million property is much different than a $400,000 property when rates go up. So how have you sort of handled that? Oh, I wasn't expecting this, right? You just got a double team thrown at you. They put a full court press as soon as you caught the ball. You're going to have to adapt in a sense. How have you handled the struggles that have come from this isn't the best market to be selling a luxury property and now that I'm ready to put on the market? I mean, honestly, it's like what you you heard at the the conference. Sometimes... You know, when you're hitting a home run, you can't worry about the outfielders. You know what I mean? And uh, one thing, know what you know. Um, not everybody's buying cribs. Not everybody's doing this and the other. But I'm not pertaining to a certain type of market. You know what I mean? So uh, the guys that can, have, the people that can afford an $11 million crib or afford this and the other. Yeah. They haven't stopped shopping. That's a great point. They haven't stopped living. They haven't stopped hopping on their jets. They haven't stopped hitting their yachts. You know what I mean? One of the conversations the dude had with me was like, damn, I low-key wanted deeper water. So it's like, damn, baby, you want $20 million worth of stuff. Like, you understand what I'm saying? So, like, I think the number one thing is, you know, you're a shark. You're a lion. Rob, you're the same thing. When you swim with sharks and lions, you don't really worry about, you know, uh, you don't really worry about eating grass. You understand what I'm saying? I'm so glad to hear you say that. Yeah. Because that's where I think the people listening to the podcast that are the most discouraged – they're buying the $220,000 property in the worst area where there's a hundred more of them in the same space. And they're, they're having a hard time making that deal work, or they're having a hard time finding the opportunity. You went out and you found a property that other people were not looking for. You remodeled it better than the other homes around it, knowing that you, that would be a good return on your money. You did it in an asset class where quite frankly, and and this is the point I was going to make, but you kind of made it for me. A lot of people buying $11 million properties aren't getting loans in the first place. So they don't care what the interest rate is. Yeah, they don't care. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, The ladies just like, I kind of wish we had more space on the first flight. They're worried about that type of thing. Like, yeah, they're going to go spend $2 million to knock walls down and add it to make it bigger. They're not, money doesn't mean the same thing to them that it does to us, right? Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and that's humbly speaking. So I'm not not, try, not no. trying to say anything from that sense, but that's literally what the mindset is. It's smart. I, that's what I'm getting at. You yeah. zig when everyone else zags, and that's yeah. why you're seeing opportunity when other people are just getting discouraged and saying, our oh, real estate's not working. Yeah. And Dave, what do you think, Rob? And you guys can tell, I have the same mindset for everything. Like, I think it's almost like, was it the, the Battle of the Alamo? They burn the ships. You know what I mean? Like I'm I'm a burn and ship type of dude. I obviously not throw all my money in it or like anything, but like I don't I'm not going into anything with fear. Do you understand what I'm saying? I granted with my preparation and everything prior to that, but like 
I, I put great mojo, great belief, and great energy into my team and a preparation into it that like it's like, yo, when they come see this or whatever work that I have, when they come see this, they're going to understand. It'll, you know what I mean? I, I believe that the right people showing up are going to understand and, and they're going to want to purchase the property and love the property and see it far out amongst the times. Yeah, totally. I, I don't know. I think a lot of people just aren't down with mistakes and failures. And so when that mistake happens, they get to that point. It's a lot harder for people to grasp that. It, and they're like, I don't, I'm, I'm going to be real stubborn about it. I'm, I'm not going to learn from this. For me, I'm just like, look, real estate is all a journey. Um, I, I always say we don't become real estate experts by everything going right. We become real estate experts by everything going wrong. So I don't really go into stuff with the fear of really fear either, but I'm also down for whatever happens. I'm like, I will become better, smarter, wealthier from whatever happens, from whatever deal I make. Yeah. And I hope, I hope I never lose. I hope we never lose that invincibility for real. You know what I mean? Cause that's a, that's a skill. That's a talent because, uh, for whatever reason, whatever God gave me, I, I don't worry about the serious stuff. And then I'll, I'll flip out over, you know what I mean? If somebody ate my last brownie, like, you know what I mean? Like something stupid like that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, but it, it really is those little things that that's what makes us invincible. You know, genuinely, I've had so much stuff happen to me in my short term rental journey. <laughs> I've, a couple weeks ago, someone said an intruder broke in, cops came, there's a manhunt. It turned out that they just turned on the light switch and scared themselves. Uh, a couple of weeks before that, I had four bears break into my cabin. And every time I'm talking to like I, when the intruder situation happened with my when my neighbors were at my house having dinner, and then you know same they were just like, "How are you so calm? This is a big deal." And I was like, "Well, it's probably not really what you think." And it, all those things that blow up are really never a big deal to me. I feel like I've got such thick skin because of all the little, you know, bruises that I've encountered along the way. And now I'm just like, yeah, literally effectively anything can happen to me and I'm going to be okay because it's, I know that there's always a solution. It just may not be convenient. Yeah. And you also need that poise because you comprehend once you handle one solution, it's always going to be another problem. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I've been trying to just learn how to be a solution maker and, you know, keep my poise through there. And at the end of the day, with the solutions, it, it, no, it allows you to comprehend your staying focused on a bigger, bigger picture. One of the ways that I've found to help overcome that fear of making a mistake, fear of losing something, is I stop looking at money the way I used to. Like you've mentioned a couple of times, Evan, I see money now as a store of energy. Like I, I put an eight-hour workday in doing this thing. I was, I was given money as a way of storing the energy that I put in on that workday. And I can take that energy and I can convert it into real estate where it will grow, stocks where it might grow. I could go spend it on Air Force Ones and I've converted it into shoes that like are right that don't store energy very well. Like it's I I just sort of like I'm kind of like Neo in the Matrix where I'm seeing the code as opposed to just seeing the wall that everybody else is looking at and money comes and it goes like you're going to make mistakes. If you, if I use the same analogy of basketball, when you're learning to play, you're going to make turnovers. Like you're going to make mistakes. You're going to lose. You're going to get shots blocked. I, could, I it's weird. I could tell you the stories learning to play basketball where I first learned the painful lesson that if you're not really fast and you're dribbling the ball on the open floor, people will dr- come up behind you and steal it. I remember just thinking like, I think it was probably around the time I went from like eighth to ninth grade, like, damn, these varsity guys, like they will jump in between and intercept the pass you through. You can't look <laughs> right at the guy you're going to throw it to. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. If I get a rebound and I don't hold it really hard, someone's going to smack it out of my hands. This stuff sounds silly, but it was like a, a um, paradigm shift at the time. Like I have to approach playing basketball differently. And then my, my, I adjusted to it. But if I wouldn't have put myself in the situation to make those mistakes, I wouldn't have gotten better at what I did. And if you try to just never by, by trying to avoid money, if you never invest it, if you never jump into a new endeavor, you just don't get better. And you live in a state of fear your whole life. The thing that even though I made the turnover, I learned a skill. Even though I uh, threw a bad pass, I left my feet to pass, I, I missed a shot, I learned something about basketball and that can't be taken away, right? That's how I tend to see business endeavors and entrepreneurship. If you are looking at how you become better, the turnovers don't matter. That means you can't have an ego. You can't be looking at these scenarios and saying like, well, if I fail, that means I'm a failure. You have to look at it like it's a game. 
if I lost the game, I got better, I'm more likely to win the next one and I ascend into higher levels of competition with more rewards. And I, that's what I'd like to pull out of what you're describing right here is it, this humility you have is such a powerful force in your success because you're you're saying I'll burn the ships and I'll figure it out as I go and they might they might kill my whole army but man I will learn a lot about warfare and I'll build a better army and come back and I'm going to win that time those skills never leave you and that's the real value in what you're doing uh, absolutely and and I'm glad it translates you know what I mean and um one thing my mentor always just told me is like take full advantage of the NBA take full advantage of basketball cuz it's going to teach you everything you need to know about, you know, running your own business one day. So, you know, a lot of times we correlate it sometimes. I, I, number one thing is just coming back from what I learned on the court and learn, you know, from the people around me. And, uh, you know, you just take it step by step. There's so many times where people like you that have been very successful have had a foundation in something for you that was basketball, applied it to a new endeavor, business, and your learning curve was much shorter than everybody else's. You hit that point of success quicker because you had this foundation to build on. And that's why I'm always preaching the message that quit looking at real estate as the escape from the life you don't like. You're bad with girls. You're, you you hate your job. Your boss doesn't like you. Like if you can't be good where you're at, you're probably not going to be good when you get into the new thing, right? Like instead, develop excellence in whatever job God happens to happen you in in that moment, and then apply that to the next opportunity that you get. And it's like this staircase approach. And that's what I love about what you're sharing is you didn't you didn't have an advantage over anybody listening to this or anyone else. Do it. it's not like you just had. Uh, advisors fall from the sky and angels come up to you and say, I want to help bless you, right? You had a foundation that you that was helpful to you and you just built on it. And now you're talking about, how do I get bigger? I have a vision. I want to get into development. I want to have luxury condos with a 7-Eleven and a CVS at the ground floor. I want to pair stability, which is low risk, low reward with luxury, which is high risk, high reward. And like you see these angles because of the stuff you've done before. And so that's one of my favorite parts about the story that you're sharing is it just it's encouraging that whatever team you're on, whatever sport you're playing, whatever thing you're doing, give it everything you have. Show up and do your best every single day. And then look for the people to start passing you the ball rather than the guys that say, well, when I when I get the ball, then I'll try. When I'm the man, then I'll give my effort. No, and you're absolutely right. And 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 I'm glad we hit that point because a lot of times, even with friends, and I'm sure the same way, people think it's some type of pill you take. You know what I mean? Or some type of drink you have or you go to the store and grab medication. It's like, nah, dog, this started 10 years ago back when you thought it was unsexy and cool. You know what I mean? Or like this hard work or whatever you're going to get isn't going to be cool. By the time you get your you reap your benefits, you probably don't even care about them because you're already on something else. But mm. it's, you know what <laughs> yeah, I mean? It's a, a great point. Yeah. Like you're oh, literally yeah. that locked exactly in. how it works. Yeah, you're literally that locked in and passionate about it. And then like six years down the line, you're like, damn, I did that six years ago. I was a real life animal. And I hadn't. But before you know it, and luckily so, you, you pick your head up and it's a consistency of greatness or a, a certain level that you maintained that allows you to cross over like we all all have in order to be successful. And um, I'm just grateful to be in Especially with real estate. Yes, yes. Like, Rob, wouldn't you agree that the best deals you've got going right now were the, probably the ones you bought the longest time ago? Oh, of course. Yeah, we're all a genius because we bought 10 years. When you, yeah. you buy 10 years ago, you're a genius at any point in the in the cycle. So, yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and everybody's like, how'd you do that? How'd you do that? It's like, well, during this time, I, I picked on weight. I picked up weight. I went and did this. Like, literally, you just invested and left. You know what I mean? It's not like you're sitting there in certain areas. Not like you're sitting there, like, working it, working it, working it. But there's certain stuff where you invest it, leave, make sure it's getting ran and just stay and keep it set up on a certain form of consistency to be to go with the times. Which is so funny because everyone's looking for the opposite. They're like, I hate my job. I want to just focus on my one property all the time. And that isn't that never works. It's like, it's literally the best properties I have are the ones I forget I own, if I'm yeah. being honest. Like <laughs> yeah, when I forget yeah, that absolutely. that is my property, I'm like, damn, look at this. It's been making all this money for all the ones that are crossing my path all the time and the ones I didn't I don't like. Right. And there's definitely a trend with the the more recently I bought it, the worse it performs. And that stops a lot of people because they're always what I say is they look at year one. 
They run an analysis. Like, does it make me an 18% return right off the bat? It doesn't. Bad deal. I'm moving on to the next one. Yeah, you might as well go hop on Robin Hood if, if you're looking for that type of return. You know what I mean? Well, yep. that, that is something that like I often get people that are like, well, yeah, of course you're doing well. You bought the property five years ago. And I'm like, well, guess what? 10 years from now, you're going to be saying the same thing when I look <laughs> smart for having yeah, bought yeah. consistently. Yeah. As long as, I always it's tell funny. friends, like, just buy something. Like literally, like not buy something, but like eventually it's year four or five and we're still pump faking on you buying your first property. It's like, dog, this is, this is pointless. We You could have had three or four by this time and we could have been having this conversation in a completely different atmosphere as opposed to my condo. I'm so glad you said that. That's exactly right. I, I look at it like, okay, do I, in five years, how will this property perform? I almost don't even look at year one, right? Like I, I make sure yeah, I have enough either. money. Yeah. In case it in case it goes poorly, I can float it. But I want to know how am I going to feel in five years to ten years, and all of a sudden, the matrix of decisions you got to make become a lot more clear. You're not that thirty two thousand dollar Indiana property that you're like, oh, that's so tempting, man. Like, no, it's not. When you look at ten years later, and it's worth thirty three thousand, and it's been <laughs> every day you've had a new issue with it. And those are usually people that go and tell everybody, like, y'all own this property. I own this property, and it's like, bro, that's the worst property you could have ever chose. Yes, like that's literally. Cool. Yeah, it'd be like buying a bunch of terrible cars that you dump all your money into all the time, but you're bragging because you're like, oh, I got 12 cars. You're like, no, you have 12 problems. That's <laughs> you, sh- you don't want that, right? Yeah, no lie. That's real. That's real. <laughs> and that's why humility is so important because it's ego that leads people to say, man, at the next conference I go to, I want to say I got X amount of doors. I got X amount of units, right? Yeah, and I, I'm I'm literally, bro, that's one thing. The only thing I, I'm a competitor and I compete at basketball like a high level, but like... um. I'm good on a journey and minding my own business. You understand? Uh, I think one thing that occurs as you get older, even like doing contract negotiations, the humility in that is making sure you don't miss out on your money or your or the right deal or situation, worrying about what the person left or right has. You know what I mean? It's kind of like a marriage. It doesn't that that relationship has nothing to do with anybody besides those two people. So when it comes to my my real estate journey, it's like, hey, if I'm gonna do this ten unit over here. I would love to come back to the next conference with 10 or 15 more units, but the interest rates aren't hidden on that property the right way, or I might have to wait until this sells or that sells. It's like, that's my situation. And God willing, I'm around for a hundred more years to keep, keep turning flips and keep making the next move, my best move. David, I've got an analogy uh, as, as we wrap up here to, uh, I, I think, I think I've got, I well, too have in a your basketball. pocket have led to some Yes, that's right. Let me, mm-hmm. hear, let me hear. I would say that this podcast interview was a slam dunk. <laughs> okay. Huh? <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah, that wasn't even supposed to be funny. It just shocked me. <laughs> that shocked me. Oh, that's so bad. It's so bad that I laughed at it. It was a triple double, I'll say. You also reminded me of what it was like to host a Brandon Turner who knows absolutely nothing about every sport. <laughs> like he, That's he, me. he, <laughs> that, he know, would I, impress me with how little he knew about any sport at all. Bro, that beer was impressive though. And he's six six, so I'm surprised he never he's played tall. any sport. But he's a surfer though. Well, he got into surfing mostly because he's terrible at sports, right? And so, like, you know, one of the one of the first interviews, one of the first jobs I ever got out of college was I was a copywriter for Gatorade. So I would write all of their tweets and all of their Instagram posts and Facebook uh, posts. And then when they were interviewing me, they were like, "Yeah, so are you a sports guy?" And I was like, huh, "Me? Yeah, oh, yes, love." Love the the all of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then when I got hired, they were all like, you're such a liar. Bruh. And I was like, well, you like me, though, so it's all good. Man, I feel you. But any job, when he asks, why are you here? It's like, bro, I'm trying to get paid. Like, don't ask, <laughs> don't ask me that question. Like, why am I here? I can do it all, sir. Like, you know, <laughs> that's right. And I did all right. I did all right. I love the Gatorade marketing campaign. Did you have anything to do this one, Rob, where they would take like the black and white athlete and they would make their sweat the color of the Gatorade? You guys remember that? Yeah. Yeah. But that, that was like, that was literally like when I was born. That was like okay. 1990, 1991. I but I'd love to take credit for that. That was a cool thing they did. Sure. Yeah. I, I made that up. That was my thing. The coolest Gatorade commercial was Phil Jackson discussing uh, Michael Jordan when he's talking about the flu game. Oh, yeah. Mm hmm. And he was saying, like, that's the first time I ever, like, believed in will. He was like, I never, like, that was the first time I ever seen, like, will really be a thing. You know what I mean? We were talking about that the other day. Just how, like, certain um, scenarios or environments will bring the best out of you. Like, that's what happened is his environment, meaning how he felt, was so hard 
that he had to rely more on Will to have the the flu game, which is, you know, NBA iconic performance. And I think that's so important of a lesson because there's people that come from incredibly difficult environments that have a lot of pain and they waste that pain. That pain is a fuel that will propel you way past the comfortable person who grew up in Orange County and went to an Ivy League school and has nothing to drive them, right? You're absolutely right. You don't know how many kids that come from my AAU program or like come from like my background or like my like even like certain teams I played on and I'm like, yo, he's as good as you. He's as good as you were. And da, 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 da. Then when it turns out he wasn't, it's like, bro, do you know like do you, like do you know like, like what background or upbringing I came in where like it's deeper than just like if you put a ball through the hole like this is Darwinism. This is survival of the fittest. It's either we're eating today or we're not. So like I'm never people that win. Yeah, and I'm never losing. Period. Point blank. That's a beautiful approach because that whether people want to admit it or not, that's the real estate environment we're in right now. There are not enough of the best homes to go around. Interest rates were kept very low for a long time. So people got into our game that never wanted it. But business people are now investing in real estate because they can get a better return here than they can in other things. The tax code benefits real estate more than other things. And so wealthy people, everyone's fighting over these things. And and you were just over here, man, I can't find a deal. I don't understand. They don't understand. You're in like, you're lions and you're all trying to find the few gazelle that are out there. And that's why you got to listen to podcasts like this and approach it with everything you have. I like it, like you're saying, it's Darwinism. And those that understand that are the ones that win. And those that think that they're sort of in like a communistic kumbaya, oh no, everything's going to be fine, are very frustrated that things aren't working out. Man, when shit get tough, man, like this, my fault for cursing, but I snap into a slim gym. This is crunch time, fourth quarter. Like I, I like these type of situations. So like, I'm sure you guys are the same way. So it's, it's, uh, it's a hell of a time to be in right now. So on that note, I'll ask you, Evan, before we get you out of here, where do you see the future of real estate or the economy going? And what's your recommendation for the moves that people should be making in the next two years? Well, hopefully the first one, I, ho- I hope the, you know, the interest rates drop sooner than later. I, I for sure want that to go on. And um, I think it's going to be something in regards to kind of similar fitting the the same way of how the world is going as well i feel like everything is kind of a borderline of like improv mixed in with casual so i think we're going to see a lot of more developments more properties and more uh innovative uses in the real estate market that is going to be cool i mean similar to you know the the hotel the 20 unit hotel you bought in uh New York and how you're changing that type of uh, real estate market. I can't really put a thumb on it, but I, I think anything goes right now in, in regards to uh, the real estate market, what you create and, and what comes about. And um, I'm looking forward to that. Beautiful. So look for creative ways rather than just trying to push the same score peg through the round hole that isn't working. Yeah, because you got to break it down. Like We had this argument earlier. Like, I mean, I guess we're turning into the cooler, older, unhip guys, you know what I mean? Or the weird, older, unhip guys, and that's still pretty cool. So imagine what we're going to create, you know what I mean? It's not going to be the same, like, st- stick up your butt, like, suit and tie, like, weird type of stuff. I think it's going to be some cool, hip, creative stuff where, you know, hopefully it turns into uh, like one big game of Sims, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, if that, if that art in your background is any indication, you will yeah. be one of the, the forefront leaders in that movement. So thanks for spending your time with us and your thoughts, Evan. I appreciate it. They're both hey, very valuable. I appreciate you guys for real. Thank you again. Uh, if people want to find out more about you, where can they go? Uh, if you want to find out more about myself, please uh, tune in to uh, Point Forward Podcast. Everywhere where you listen to podcasts, it's actually amazing. It really is. And then uh, you check me out on uh, Instagram. My name is uh, Evan Turner, E-V-A-N-T-U-R-N-E-R. And then also on Twitter, the Kid E-T, T-H-E-K-I-D-E-T. Show some love, holler at me, give me some advice, keep it classy. Rob, how about you? Where can people find out more about you? Um, You can find me uh, on, well, okay, well, first of all, look, you could, I, I typically I would say you can go find me on YouTube at Rob Built, and you can go follow me on Instagram at Rob Built. Of course, I could say that, but what I'm going to say instead of following me over at Rob Built is to go over the Apple iTunes Review Center, the, the podcast app. Leave us a five-star review. If, if you like hearing these conversations, these real-world conversations of how to get started in real estate, please go drop us a five-star review. It means the world to us, and it lets, you know that, it lets us know that you're listening, and it helps us improve how we do the show. What about you, David? Well, now I really want to know where I could find you, and you've kind of left me with an itch I need scratch. So <laughs> after I do that, after I do that, 
Is there a preferred way of following you? Where's your best content? Oh, yeah. You can find me over uh, on YouTube at uh, Nothing But Net. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Rob- <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, what they, like, like, it, it's uh, my sports channel, actually. Um, <laughs> you can find me at. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Why not? Right? Nothing but net. Oh, my gosh. That's I forgot that was a phrase people used to say. Man, we we were really corny in the 80s. That is such a nothing. Yeah, that was a thing that was said. Swish. It, but, yeah, swish. NBN, baby. Every one of Rob's basketball references comes straight out of NBA Jam. He's the mm. guy that's like, boom shakalaka every time. From downtown. <laughs> He's on fire. (laughs) I told you, man, I'm an 80s baby. What we used to say when you blocked a shot, you got packed. Remember that? You got packed. I haven't heard that one in a very long time. No, the the best thing I think that still hangs on that hasn't been corny is, uh, and one of the best basketball commercials was a Sprite Tim Duncan, Kobe Bryant commercial. But anytime you missed the dunk, the label was like, damn, you just got Sprited. Like, you know what I mean? I thought that. That was good. I used to love the uh, Sprite commercial with the three actors pretending to be hard basketball players, but they were like thespians. Wait, no, I got I got to look that up. I got to ask this. Excuse story. me. Excuse me. What's my motivation? That guy? Oh, I got to check that. I'll- oh, that's a really funny one, Rob. Uh, we talk about it all the time because he's always asking for his motivation. He is a thespian pretending to be a podcast. Host. I did let her in theater. So oh, did that's you? How co- that's how cool I am. Mm-hmm. Well, what role broke your heart that you decided to leave? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, I was that? Snoopy like, and you're a good man, Charlie Brown. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's funny. All right, Evan, thanks a lot, man. Perfect. It's been great having you. Uh, I don't know if we have plans for me to do your podcast, but I'd be happy to do it. I think it'd be a lot of fun. No, I'd be lit. We would love to have you guys on. Um, thank you for the hospitality. This is lit. What you guys are doing is unbelievable. Um, I'm grateful for what you guys do week in and week out. And I, uh, once again, thank you for uh, being so open when I showed up to the conference and, um, everything you guys are awesome guys i I really appreciate you thank you thank you evan uh you can find me on social media at david green 24 and i just tagged evan so if you're seeing this go make sure you follow his account and uh get some good content i'm gonna repost too i hate when people don't all right hold on Uh, let's do this on air i'm gonna get a photo of us ready that's the first right there that's the first interrupting a podcast for a selfie yeah That's, that's how that's good it's how that, narcissistic we become. That's uh, that's how progressive this day and age is. The work, the work field is. <laughs> All right, thanks, Evan. We're gonna get you out of here. All this right, is love. David Green for Same. Rob Slim Jim's in his shirt pocket. Abasolo, signing out. <laughs> <laughs>